All right then, good afternoon, distinguished guests, speakers, and everyone. I'm also extending this good afternoon good to good mornings and good evening to those of you who are joining us online from the rest of the world. And thank you very much for joining us on the WebEx Live, also from the NAC 2022 website, as well as the NSTDA Facebook page. I'm live from the National Science and Technology Development Agency here in Thailand. And this event is brought to you by the NSTDA Annual Conference 2022. Well, first of all, welcome to the session on the future of food from the lens of risk and resilience. Lessons learned from Thailand and the UK collaborations where we are sharing with you the different research projects funded from the Newton Fund and beyond and that we are supporting this through essential fast growing sector here in Thailand. This, of course, will be including touching on technological developments managing waste, looking at resilience and safety against shock. And finally, we will be how we can be readily prepared for the uncertain future through the use of foresight. We'll of course be sharing with you uh, on the further insights from the UK and what we of course will have, be having to offer you in the future. So make sure to stay until the end. Don't forget to share these events. If you are watching from uh, Facebook, li uh, Facebook Live, do share them with your friends and colleagues and do give us some likes or emoji. We really much appreciate that. If you also have any comments or feedbacks and you, or questions you want to submit, then please feel free to submit them in the platform that you're joining from. We'll be taking the questions and we'll be asking the speakers specifically at the end of their own presentations and afterwards. Now, we've got two hours and a half, I believe, for, for this session and there are several people lining up here for the presentations. So I'll be starting off first, officially starting with the keynote speaker for today, which we are having the Science and Innovation Regional Director for Southeast Asia from the Foreign, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office or the FCDO. So this is Miss Eleanor Buxton. Eleanor, unfortunately, is not able to be here with us in person today. So we'll be hearing from her from a recording instead. So I'm passing this over to our tech team for the video recording play. Over to you, tech team. So, Adhika, um, as introduced, my name is Eleanor Buxton. Uh, I'm the Regional Director for Southeast Asia Science and Innovation. So I oversee the Science and Innovation Network, including the Newton Fund in Southeast Asia, joining in from the British High Commission in Singapore. Many thanks to the National Science and Technology Development Agency for hosting this week's conference. The NSTDA is one of three key Thai research organisations who have worked together with the UK since the first year of the Newton Fund. On behalf of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and the Newton Fund, I would like to thank you for NSTDA, NSTDA's continued support for our strong Thailand-UK partnership on science, research and innovation. We want to capture the great success and the best of the existing partnerships that builds on our success under the Newton Fund and celebrates its achievements. This means being able to showcase some of the achievements and outcomes of the Newton Fund since its start in 2014, celebrating researchers, in-country teams and partner organisations and their efforts over the years to make the funds a success, and sharing knowledge and building capacity, including from our other 17 partner countries. The campaign will run from next week until the end of September. As we look to the future, we will be focusing on a number of areas and strengthening our science and technology partnership with Thailand and Thai researchers. First, critical and emerging technologies, so building partnerships on key new technologies and supporting changes in Thai regulation in this area to reflect international best practice. Second, health, working across science, technology and innovation to improve health outcomes including on genomic sequencing and pandemic preparedness. And third, climate. So tackling climate change and biodiversity loss and ensuring that those commitments during COP26 are delivered. In Southeast Asia, a major, major focus of our work on climate and the environment is agriculture and food security. The food sector plays a critical role in the growth of the Thai economy. To ensure it adapts to global changes, we have worked with key research and innovation organisations and universities in Thailand to support the sector's sustainability and resilience for the uncertain future. I look forward to hearing from some of our grant recipients today, including a recipient of one of the Leaders in Innovation Fellowships. I hope that the seminar today will add tremendous value to our common goals of technological and economic development and further bolster the strong relationship between the UK and Thailand. 
Finally, I'm very sorry that I can't join the event in person. I look forward to joining you next time and to meeting some of you in person on my next visit to Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eleanor, and that in indeed has put us into a great context here where the UK, of course, is also emphasizing climate change, agriculture and food sector as one of the key development that we need to look into into the future. And that includes the Thailand priorities here as well, where it's a very big sector going forward. So thanks again, Eleanor. So up next, I'd like to go into our next session, and that will be hearing from four key Thai researchers who have received the support from the Newton Fund and the Thai government to pursue their bilateral projects with the UK partners. And for those of you who are not aware of what the Newton Fund is, so the Newton Fund is a seven year long grant by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy from the UK government, or BASE for short, and the fund supports international partnerships between Thailand and the UK here to collaborate, share experience and knowledge through multiple platforms and schemes all in the while making sure that the projects do align with the national priorities here in Thailand. And of course, food development and agritech are some of them that you'll be hearing today. So first up, I'd like to, uh, to call upon our first grant recipient or the first speaker here. So this is Dr. Fong Thip, Tiang Buranatham, Buranatham from Chiang Mai University. And she's one of the grant recipients from the Newton Fund Impact Scheme, which is a grant to support extending of the impacts from the previous projects. So this impact scheme project uh, is supported by the National Research Council of Thailand, or NSTDA, and is on the resilient food systems with uncertainty and shocks. All right then, Dr. Bong Kip over to you. Uh, Dr. Pong Hippo, you're on mute. You ask your on mute cup, Dr. Pong Hippo. Okay, does this work now? Yes, yes, I can hear you well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, ha, let's start again. I'm representing the project Reimagining Food System Coping with Uncertainty and Shocks, or we call it short as refocus, um, trying to refocus our attention to what is actually a food system and how we can make it more resilient or um, coping better with different kind of risk in Thailand. And it is an honor for us to receive Newton Fund and also in collaboration with NRCT so that we can um, transfer some knowledge from the UK and actually trying to implement it in Thailand. Um, the first part of this project, I was asked to give a project introduction and also the problem statement. We started off with um, this picture from our previous project based on the problem of air pollution in the north of Thailand, as you may have heard before. We are trying to apply the approach of system dynamic to air pollution problem in north of Thailand, which has become um, and has become a realization that is not a single, we cannot single out air pollution problem from the food system because the, the root cause of air pollution is the burning of agricultural waste and also clearing up of the land for animal feed products. So that we have to look into the food system as a whole system related to air pollution as well, not just one problem. So that's how that's where we have started our project with our partner in York University. And when we try to look at food system as a system of activity, not food as something that um, we enjoy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner three times a day, but actually as um, as a system, a combination of different elements within the system, it is a bit more unusual than um, what we normally think about food. So that we we have been struggling to try to um, impose the idea of food as a system rather than food as um, a dish of delicious things that we can eat, but as a whole thing. So that we, from our previous project on the institutional link, we we work on different elements and drivers 
that's created environmental drivers, um, especially the air pollution problems. And then we realize that we have to actually look into to the food system activities. And from that, that project, we realized that not a lot of people understand food as a system or as a combination of elements, but they, they view food as something they simply eat and enjoy. So that we came up with a second project. We asked Newton Fund if we can um, encourage people to see food as a system and trying to find ways to strengthen it um, through different drivers and reducing the impact. So this is um, where we came in. This is our problem statement for the project. So from, from the first project, the co-producing knowledge and environmental solution, which is an institutional link partnership project, we our project focused on Mazam district, where they had a lot of um, open burning for agricultural of agricultural waste for animal feed products. Then we realized that what, what was the kind of um, supply chain for creating food in Mazam and how it has changes over the year. So through that process, we adapted it to um, the tools that we are talking right now. The, we're trying to co-develop, test, and apply this tool in a participatory diagnostic and dialogue of food system fragility and resilience. Trying to identify components of food system from natural resources, infrastructure, technology, institution, and also actors, and assessing its fragility and criticality for failure. Um, resilience as a self-assessment and dialogue tools so we um, came up with something. So we, um, I will go on to explain a little bit more of what our project specifically do. First, we taste and refine the tools. From the previous project, we had a two-day workshops with experts on food system from around the world, from the UK, from Australia, and also from Thailand as well. Then we, we sort of prepared some materials and also the sequence of the workshop of um, what are the key ideas that we would like people to know or what are the key elements of the food system that they should know in order to be able to identify the weakness in the food system and how to actually improve it. So we prepared the material for the diagnosis and dialogue tools um, and also support trainings with, some, with our partners as well. We document the lessons learned through video policy brief and peer review paper. And we are trying to disseminate this um, tools by using a web-based tool, which is under development at the moment. So this is where we have started with um, offline workshops, um, lots of post-its and tables and discussion about food system. And then to, we, when we started off the project, when we were writing the proposal, we thought we could do it um, in a similar manner offline. Um, in a room where people can concentrate, we can look at their um, facial expressions. But when COVID-19 came also, we realized that we could not do it um, in the same manner. So we adapted um, our tools to become a web-based tools. So it will be an online tools um, with a combination of Zoom and also Miro tools. So we also try to do a hybrid workshop between offline, online, using Miro. So we use a Miro as um as our tools we ask the participants or what do you think of that of your food system different kind of um who are involved in different components of the food system what are the weaknesses and the potential impacts so we conducted about three hybrid workshops and also some purely online um workshops as well to test this tool so we have been talking to people we um adjusted our templates um many different times according to how people perceived and understand different questions and how we um, explain to them. So um, people are listening and they realize that uh, food is not just food anymore. There's a, food is just the tip of the iceberg and there's actually a lot more to it than, than it has been or how they had understood it. So we did um, three hybrid workshops and now we are quite confident with the templates and the sequencing of the workshop, making sure that people um, start from drawing their own food system, how they understood their food system, um, what are the impacts and also the stakeholders involved and also identifying the weakness. And then we were able to ask the participants to discuss about different elements of um, resilience, such as diversity. Do they think they have enough diversity in their food production? Do they have enough diversity in um, food logistics? Is there any uh, difficulties in getting food if 
one producer is not available and similar things and asking them to give the scores, then they are able to identify um, the points where individual can take actions or the points where collective actions is needed in the food system. So these are the, the sort of things that we do. So we we have different boards and then we ask them to answer to different questions. We had um, four boards. Number one is food, food system mapping exercise. Um, number two is identify potential weakness. And number three, what are the potential impacts and who, uh, where it has stemmed from these weaknesses. And also lastly, we ask them to do a self-assessment scorecard. What do they think about their own food system? against the characteristic of resilience. Um, yeah. So the outcome of the workshops and what we learned is that knowing food is not the same as knowing food system. There are gap exists in understanding food as a system, as I mentioned before. Um, it is difficult to define a boundary of food system. So one of the, the lesson learned that we, we, we took from these exercises that we conducted the workshop is that when we talk about food, um, we can go to Italy for that, or we could go to Japan for that. Um, if you think about sushi, or if you think about spaghetti, or um, you could think about um, fish and chips in the UK, but in Thailand, we could think like different kind of dishes from the north, from the south. So when, when we talk about food, trying to define the boundaries, we ask the participant to focus only on one type of food so that it can scope down the boundary of where that food came from. Um, for example, we did um, one of the food system for eggs, for example, so that's uh, quite simple. So the participant focus on where the eggs come from and where do they buy their eggs and who produce the eggs for example, or rice. Um, different people may have different sources of rice. Um, some may order it directly from the farmers, some buy it from the supermarket, and we discuss with the participants based on those. And one problem that we also face is that the stakeholders in the workshops tend to focus on the family issues and the general problems that they have with their own food system. Um, they do not like to think out of the box. So one of the dialogue tool, one of the advantage of it being a dialogue tools is that the facilitator or the person who leads the meeting can introduce them to different kind of examples. We were very fortunate to have been partnered with University of York who has extensive work on food system and they were able to introduce um, different examples from the UK. For example, the example of um, COVID-19 when there were lost of, um, when the truck drivers was down with COVID and a lot of them were off, off work for that. So there was no food delivered to the supermarket or an example of um, the fertilizer industry is not producing carbon dioxide gas to be filled with the meat packaging because they were, because the oil price has gone up and it was not uh, economical to produce, to keep producing fertilizer. So we were able to introduce um, out of the box um, issues to the participants and the stakeholders so that they can think of, oh, if this happened, that might happen instead of, oh, this had happened and that had happened. So these are the, the kind of things that we learned and then um, we will include those in our tools as well. And also we and we learned that this, the scale and the scope and the complex of inter interdependence of the system cannot be identified. It illustrates how far beyond our own control our food system is. Some of the issues we cannot control, such as um, the exporting or importing quota of different kind of food, for example, or uh, the policies on the source of food, for example. These are some of the things that might be on our control, but we try to, to focus the participants on some of the actions that they could take as well. So for the bigger outcome of this project might be um, we are working with potential agencies such, such as um, Chiang Mai Provincial Administrative o Organization. Um, they are responsible for the local policy direction so that we, we ask them to think about food, where food was coming from in Chiang Mai and how they can um, guide policies for the food production and how to make Chiang Mai more 
food more sustainable because a lot of food in Chiang Mai is exported, but at the same time, a lot of them has been importing to Chiang Mai as well. And we also work with local municipality, Mahia municipality quite closely to test the tools in the local area and asking Mahia municipality to initiate um, a pilot site for local organic vegetables um, and used and producing organic compost from the leaves and small branches that was collected in the area and also to support those who have lost their job due to COVID pandemic. And Mahiat municipality is um, starting to guide their own food policy as well. So they, that's another um, partnership that came up. And also we've been working closely with the Thai City Farm Network to expand um, sustainable food system. And there will be some of the people who adopted our tools as well. So these are some of the local partners that we already established a network with. Other, other project benefits to uh, maybe the community, the social society and the public so that they have better understanding of the food system to increase their own food security, improve the well-being and the quality of life, including creating sustainability and sustainable food production for the community and prepared for future climate crisis. Um, economics in terms of understanding the vulnerability of food system and identify commercial opportunity for the public sector or com community enterprises. And in terms of policy aspect, to, to reduce vulnerability of food system in Thailand, to make Thai food system more resilient to uncertainties and strengthening um, the food supply chains. It also links with um, policies in many sectors, including agriculture, um, logistic food industry and food services as well. Pricing and re retail mechanism of food in com commercial food safety and nutrition value so that public can have um, better information and better informed about um, their own food as well. Academic, we are developing online tools, which is which uh, will launch the website around May because we need to refine and finish our tools first before we, we launch it in a web-based form. And research summary videos and also academic paper is preparing for publication. So this is what we do and what we have done. And if I'm not sure if th there's enough time for Q&A, but if you would like to have to get more information, you can contact us with this email address. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Kapatan Pongchip. So um, I, I do have a few questions, if, if I may. Um, so we do have a, a little bit of time for, for some Q&A. So um, let me just ask you quickly. So um, the, the project itself is pretty much looking at uh, food system as a whole. And this, I understand this involves those being um, from coming from, from Chiang Mai, if I understand correctly, is that right? So, so, yes. so, yeah. so in, in this case, so just uh, going back um, in terms of people being involved, my, I myself included, how, what's the action that I should take then to, to help, you know, making sure that the systems also develop to be more resilient? Okay, um, for example, when we, we talk about, uh, if I go back to one of the workshops, some of the examples that came up with, the, with the, through the discussion with our participants is that we talk about eggs. Kun Bang, do you know where, where you buy your eggs? Or is someone else doing the shopping for you? Um, supermarkets. Okay, supermarkets. Do you know if the eggs came from a free range eggs? Is it organic eggs or is it just egg. Do you know the difference between these kind of eggs? Um, well, I would assume you would need them to look at the food packaging and believe what the packaging says. That's what I do. So, okay. so let's say, for example, I buy free range egg and I'm trusting basically the, what the labeling says, but that's it. Yes, I think that's that's one that's one of the first step that you are informed and you are interested in the information of where the source of food was coming from. So you have already taken the food steps in, in the food system. You are encouraging at least the producers that concerns about animal welfare and also the environment. So you have already taken a lot um, the first step. Um, we have different age groups of our participants and we we are analyzing them as well. For people aged below um, 30, like the almost graduate or newly graduate um, 
people, this uh, younger group, like in their early 20s, for example, um, they are more concerned about how much food costs and where it is more convenient. They do not interested in buying organic or free range eggs. It, it is more, more important for them to, to get easy access to make sure it's quick, it's fast and it's not expensive. But if we look into people whose age about like in their um, 30s, 40s, they are more interested in the, in the quality of food, how it was produced and the quality of what they are actually eating because they are more concerned about their own health and the health of the environment. So different group of people have different perspective and we will try to inform people um, based on our, uh, our findings in the website as well. So um, it's not only the food that we want them to look at, like eggs as eggs, but eggs as something that can contribute to the environment, eggs or as something that contribute to um, better income of the local people, or eggs as an import. You could have eggs imported as well. So for, for these guys are the different kind of things. And Kun Bang, you have congratulations. You have um, taken the first step in into strengthening the food system because you pick and choose what is better for the environment and also for, for, for your own health as well. So these are kind of things that we, we try to inform the participants and the, the reflections that we received. All right, thank you very much. Um, I, I do completely agree with you and, and just to reflect your, your words, an egg is not just an egg and food, knowing just the food is not basically the same as, as knowing the food systems itself. And it's very, very complex, which I think we'll be hearing further into the next speakers as well about the complexity of food, the developments and what's going on in, in Thailand and in the UK. So thank you very much, Kap, uh, Ajahn Phong Thip. Uh, maybe just a quick reminder for all of you who, who are joining or audiences joining online, the tool that Dr. Phong Thip was mentioning. So this, I believe, will be launched later in May this year. So very much looking forward to how this um, outcome of the project will be presented um, in, for, for the public to see. So thank you very much, Kap, Ajahn Phong Thip, uh, on, on your presentation here. All right then. Let's move on to our next uh, speaker. So uh, up next, we are hearing from Dr. Tantawan Pirakap from Gazetsad University, and she's a grant recipient from the Newton Fund Institutional Links uh, delivered by the British Council. And so the aim of the Institutional Links program, unlike the impact scheme previously, so IL or Institutional Link aims to um, support academic partnerships and non-academic partnerships between different institutions in Thailand and in the UK. So Dr. Tantawan Projects is supported by the Office of the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, Science, Research and Innovation. And the work is on bio-refinery approach to valorizing Thai seafood processing industry byproducts. Adan Hantawan Cup, if you are ready, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much, Bank, for a very great introduction. Um, good afternoon, um, distinguished guests. It is my Great pleasure to chair my research today. Thanks for British Council and, and, and NASA for inviting me to join this event. Let me share my screen. Today, I would like to chair my um, research in collaboration with the Harrod Watt University in Edinburgh. The research is about the biorefinery approach to virilizing Thai seafood processing industry byproducts. This project is collaborated with Professor Stephen Ustin and Professor Derek Stewart from Harrod Wood University. The research background is started long times ago because um, I received two Newton grant, travel grant in um, 2016 and 2018 to make a collaboration with the UK experts. And that's the beginning of our collaboration. And next, um, we receive another grant from GCRF. And it is a small grant under Harvard Watt University. And then we do the PhD exchange under the RRITRF grant. And we still collaborate together in the area of waste and byproducts utilization. And why we're interested in this sector? It's because of Thai seafood production and export is quite huge. And 
The Thai seafood industry is the third largest in the world. It accounts around 2% of Thai GDP. It also employs a lot of workers and also exports to earn a lot of money to Thailand. With the, a lot of seafood production, beer 700 factories, it generates a lot of byproducts, around 1 million ton a year. So with this problem, it might affect to the environment and it has very low value. The byproduct annually is 50% of the, the seafood as the shell, pay, tail, skin, gut, fin, and friends. All of these byproducts also contain high value compounds that we can go for biorefinery process and then turn it to be high value compounds. So to find the higher value, it is an option of the processing this waste, not only be profitable, but it also improve the environmental sustainability of the industry also. So the collaborated partners under our research is between Kaseisa University and Howard Watt University. We also have government sector, which is the Department of Fisheries and another three companies, um, the largest one, medium one, and the small one. This is the picture of Thai and the UK team. Here is Professor Stephen Houston. He ever been in Thailand for joining some um, uh, presentation. And this is Professor Derek Stewart. They are quite nice and we work together as a team. For the large company, they produce a lot of aquaculture, including shrimp. So the waste that we collect from a large company, it is shrimp production waste, it is paint and shells. And they they have around 1.8 million kilogram a year or around five to 6,000 kilogram a day. But from the medium size company, it is the ceramic production company. They have a lot of waste from ceramic production, including um, minced fish waste and also fish fat and some of fish wash water. For the fish minced, it contains around 2,000 to 2,500 kilograms a day, which is quite a lot. They do nothing with this. They sell as a fish meals with a very low value. The trim shells also. This is what it looked like. This is the waste from the ceramic production. For another small size company, um, they produce fresh seafood production. So they have various kinds of waste, but not that much. So we collect, finally, we collect the shrimp shells and head and mix together with a large company, West. Apart from the West that we collect. So we analyze for the properties, what's inside that. And then we decided that for the shrimp shells and head, it still contain very high protein and also edge content. And we can use it as a raw material to produce a chitin, chitosin, and chitooligosaccharide. And for a fish minced meat, it contains very high protein and also high edge. For fish minced meat, we are go further to extract the protein out and also doing the protein hydrolysis. So extract some calcium out of this meat. For the fish fat, it also contains very high fat and it contain very high uh, EPA and DHA also at the end, we find that it's contain very high EPA and DHA. And we extract the fat out of this waste. For the fish wa watch water, we um, extract for protein. So with this waste, we try another in-depth analysis, try to take a look on the amino acid profile, fatty acid profile, mineral profile, what's inside, and then we decided to go further for extraction of some collagen, astaxanthin, 
uh, protein hydrolysate and chitin and chitosan also. All of this, it changed from the seafood waste to the high value compounds. Received biorefinery process from this research. So the sustainable seafood production through the biorefinery process with the optimization and a light touch of life cycle analysis was obtained from this research. So we changed from the objectives to the deliverables. We found that the composition of the Thai seafood waste is very interesting. And then we turn it into the database of Thai seafood um, composition, as I, and I will show you later. And we also find the bio refinery process which is suitable for the waste that we collect from the industrial partners. We also try to optimize the process, the relation, and also do some life cycle analysis. Our deliverable are the receipt. We do the stakeholder meeting. We got a power refinery design with LCA. We also try to do the roadmap, which is the next step from our research. This is the database, what is look like. And it is the database of the chemical compositions and some nutritional qualities of the seafood and byproducts. Let me show you a bit. What does it look like? This is the website here. It it can change from English to Thai if you are prefer. Now I select the English one. You can click. This is the home page, and this is um, about the project. If you interested in some project summaries, it here and and the further details. And also, if you want to take a look on the composition of fish, you can click on fish. And it will show up type of the fish. You can also do the search of the type of fish that you're interested in. It contains a lot of um, type of fish. And also you can take a look various kind of the um, composition here. And at the end of the column, it is a source. In this database, some of them are from our research and we gathering a lot of information from um, the published one in this database. So if you're interested in to the um, research here, you can click to the source. It will link you to the full manuscript that publish this information. And this is um, what the database look like. Moreover, we are also try to do a survey of the Thai industry, seafood industry, technology readiness using the online questionnaire. Because we know that um, it's quite new to the industrial sector about the biorefinery process. We want to understand what they understand about the biorefinery, what do they need, and, and what we can help. So, um, after we do a survey, the important issue are resting, like investment, how much the cost of a refinery, how can we go for a um, pilot scale and also commercial scale. And the very important problem is the waste collection process because it's easy to spoil. And they do need the knowledge and the expertise from the, the um, university. So with this survey, we do a lot of activities to meeting up with the stakeholders, Thai and UK PI meetings, and also all stakeholder meeting we do it every month. And we have upcoming event on May 14 to 16. Please save the date if you're interested. And it is the workshop that we will we will um, organize with the UK expert and and with the industrial partner on the roadmap of bio and bio refinery for sustainable seafood production in Thailand. We will we, we will organize via the Zoom online platform. If you're interested in, you can also send an email to, to tell me that you're interested in, and I will then send you the link during that event. And 
We also try to continue over collaboration until the our refinery process can establish really in, in the industrial partner to start with our partner first. And moreover, uh, I also contact the EC, EECI pilot plant, bio refinery pilot plant of NASA. In, and it is very interesting because uh, in that place, it will have a lot of facilities that we can go for the pilot plant. And in the future, I will keep collaborating with the EEC, I have a refinery pilot plant for continue our collaboration and to serve the BCG economy to Thailand. So this is all uh, that I've done and that we have done in our research institutional link. And thank you very much for your attention and the questions and, and is very welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kapazan Tantawan. So we've previously we've been hearing about the food systems and, and the community engagement from the previous projects. Now we're looking at a different side of the coin. We're looking at the industrial engagement and how you can actually exploit such ways. So going back to the theme of the conference itself, BCG, you're looking to um, valorize improving the value and making sure the ways actually have more pro uh, more values and more you know more benefits to the economy. So thank you very much, Kapatan Atantai, for this. I do have some some questions here for for you as well. So I understand the project has been um, continuing since 2016. It's such a very long project. How do you yeah. en envision this? What what's kind of like your aim? with the partnership with the Herayot World University? Uh, it's because of, at the beginning, um, our research expertise is quite the same. We're interested in the same thing. And we are also expert in the protein science together, which is similar to, to the professor said. And at the beginning, we, we, we start with the protein and we try to find the suitable raw material for the extract the protein. And then we discuss together and we start with why we, why don't we use the byproducts that contain high protein to, to do the, the research and try to make it more value. And that is the, the beginning of our research. And it because of at the starting point, I am also received the like um, industrial collaborated project from the Thai Research Fund. It's also seafood waste production. So that, that's why I keep st studying this area since 2016. And then we keep um, exchange student and also trying to seek for another grant to work together. So our collaboration is still until now. That's very great to hear that, um, you know, your partnerships with the UK has been going strong. So, so yes. and I do wish that you the best of luck with, with your, your collaborations um, with the UK once again. Um, and another question, if, if I may. So um, could you please share with me briefly? So you've definitely mentioned about the upcoming projects under your, um, on the 14th to 16th of May. Could you please share with me brief, a little bit more briefly about what the, the session is fully all about? Just curious. Okay. The truth is um, we received the optimal biorefinery process for some seafood waste that we collect from industrial partners. So we will chair because we want it to be an open innovation platform we will share the biorefinery process. We will share about the database and we can, we, we want to listen from the industry. What did they think about the biorefinery to collect more information? The truth is we try to write down some roadmap, but it's not that strong. So we need more information. So that's why during the workshop, we still need to asking some 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 questions, get some information from the industry, and and also to provide them what we will going on. What is the solution for an industry if they want to go for a seafood by orifinery process? We will tell them what to do. 
I see. So, so it's basically, yeah. um, it's also a session where industry, if they're interested, they can actually input their own opinions into the upcoming roadmap. So, so they'll get involved in the session then. So thank you very much. And there's one final question. So here, I do want to look at the tech side of things. So, so you've mentioned your work on the food, seafood waste products. Are there opportunities to expand this to other waste products? For example, I don't know, poultry, swine, for example, would that be feasible in the future? The truth is, yes, it can expand to another waste, especially the sea, it, it the waste that contain high protein, which is quite the same process. Some of the pre-Romanelli said that we, it might be different, but with a similar biorefinery process, we can change some parameters to, to suggest them what to do. Yes, it can. Okay. Again, very promising um, outcomes here. And we, uh, I wish you the best of luck with your future. Hopefully, we'll get to see more, you know, different kinds of products yeah. coming out from ways supporting the circular economy. So thank you very much, Kava. Thank you. Thank you very much, so all right then. Up next, I'd like to to call upon our third speaker, the uh, grant recipient. So we will be having Dr. Natakan Soikap Gao from Mafa Luang University, also another grant recipient for the institutional links program delivered by the British Council and in support by the Office of the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, Science, Research and Innovation. The project Dr. Natakan has done is on waste to wealth and tackling the agricultural waste in Thailand to make a fully recyclable packaging. If you are ready, I'll pass over to you. Thank you for the introduction. And now let me share my uh, slide. Okay, good afternoon. Today I'm very pleased that I have the chance to share uh, about our joint project between Mafa Luong University and Queen Mary University of London. Uh, leading researcher is myself, Natakan Saikap Gao, and Dr. Han Sang at Queen Mary. The aim of this project, the first, the first aim we try to tackle the major problem in Thailand, in this region, and actually in worldwide, this problem. Because this plastic waste is a problem everywhere. And sadly, from the report, we heard that 50 to 60% of this plastic waste going into the ocean, yeah, mainly plastic packaging, of course, and it comes from five. Asian country mainly include Thailand. With this problem of Thailand, we also have another major problem about agricultural waste because each year our country produced tremendous amount of unutilized agricultural waste. As an Bong Tip also mentioned, because um, no, 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 no way. I mean, to, to do with it, farmer designed to burn it together. And then nothing come out of it, of course. But right now, like in Chiang Rai, we suffer this long lasting haze of PM 2.5. And, and now I'm going outside. The air outdoor is not safe for my lung anymore. So this brought, brought up us together to talk about how can we get rid of these two major problems at the same time. So then we came up with the idea of why not we try to turn this unutilized agricultural waste, transform them into sustainable packaging or other material. So then we can solve this air pollution from agricultural waste burning and plastic waste problem simultaneously. So the first part of this joint project, we try to transform agricultural waste into pulp and then paper packaging. So we start with our many source 
of agricultural waste, we chose a uh, rice straw, pineapple leaf, that we have a lot around Chiang Rai, and then uh, banana stem, that's plenty worldwide for this. Uh, we used soda pulping process to make them into pulp, and after we got the pulp, we do some characterization. And we found that pulp fiber from different agricultural waste, they have different characteristics. Like from this rice straw pulp fiber, it's the finest. This high apple leaf fiber, they are the longest fiber. But banana stem fiber pulp, this fiber is the biggest with the lowest cylinderness ratio. And then we try to check how strong they are. So we make them into pulp cheat. And this one is cheat from banana. And this is from rice straw. And this one from pineapple leaf fiber. So we took them to do tensile test. And this is the properties, how strong they are. We can see this rice straw sheet, and this is pineapple leaf fiber sheet, they are the strongest, but banana fiber, this is very weak. So we think further to help this banana pulp fiber. How can we make use of this weak fiber? Why not blend them together? With the blending idea, of using superior pulp to help inferior pulp. Mix them together and then preforming the water hot pressing into again mold sheet. And then check again if this can really help banana paper. And look, this is 100% um, banana paper. This stress strain curve showing us 30% of rice straw pulp blending in or 30% of pineapple leaf fiber blend in can significantly increase the strength of this pulp product more than 150%. So blending concept of dif different pulp together, it's really helping efficient to enhance quality of this weaker or inferior pulps. And we can conclude now that this agricultural waste pulp, they have great potential in packaging use. And then um, how, how can we tell this story to other people? Or how can we, we make other people can do what we can do? So in part two, we discussed about, okay, if we want the farmer to know this, let's develop the easy and low cost process to make pulp. And then we chose a rice straw to start. So with this, um, we took 10 kilogram of rice straw and then soaked in water overnight. After that, we put them into this 200 liter barrel to cook it. And this for uh, pulping condition, we aim to use the lowest chemical possible. And then we found that, okay, we can minimize it to only 1% sodium hydroxide with the ratio of liquid to so solid, eight to one, and cooking time of at least seven hours. And then after heating, we can leave it overnight for cooling down. And then the next morning, this pulp can be washed, and this is the rice straw pulp we, we got. We can also make them into sheet form and keep it like this. So from this process, the pulp yield is around 40% with acceptable lignin content to use with acceptable tensile properties or strong enough. 
with material cost only 9.5 baht per kilogram of this pulp cheat. So we we happy, we were happy with the, the number, the cost and the process. Easy enough, low cost enough. Then we decide that we're ready to share the story and then we, we organize workshop for local people, for farmer. With this, um, know how to easily produce pulp from rice straw in several local uh, area in several di district in Chiang Rai province in last October. This is the picture from the event. This is when we do the pulping process. This is when we uh, washed pulp together. This is when we um, try to perform and make this pulp into cheat or to make them into like plant pots also possible. We organize one workshop also in house at Mafalun University. And this we can deliver, uh, deliver one key message that we concern about this. It, it is about how to treat wastewater from this pulping process. And using this uh, cement block model that we set up. Now, let, let me show you the feedback. Uh, some feedback for the participant of the workshop. Sorry, um, now I'm going to share you this video clip. ก็ว่ามันเป็นการดีเพราะว่ามันเป็นความหูใหม่ๆซึ่งความหูนี่เค้าจะมาได้รับจากไฟไงหนึ่งเราลดการเผาสองเราสามารถเอาฟางข้า
sample. And this is uh, the optimized um, prototype look like, how it looked like, like this, with the thickness around 9 to 15 millimeter, with the density 170 to 340 kilogram per cubic meter. And with sound absorption performance, uh, it can be high up to NRC around 0.84, and it can be classed to class A, um, a meaning extremely sound absorbing material. With this, um, for us, impressive new prototype, then we happily came back from UK last month, and then we already shared this new know-how or technology to the Wasu company. Next, uh, not only this uh, high value added product can be made out of agricultural waste. Part four, agricultural waste can also be used to make high price material like nanomaterial. For example, nanocellulose. We also interested in nanotechnology to turn agricultural waste into this uh, nanofibrillated cellulose using high pressure homogenizer, for example. This nanocellulose is not only high price, but it also has high performance. That's why okay, we think, why not? We're using this nanocellulose to help mobile packaging. Because when we compare mobile packaging, paper packaging to common plastic packaging, always this paper packaging, they're not resistant to water enough. It cannot block the air to transport in and out. Not enough gas barrier. So, okay, we got the idea to use this nanocellulose, put in the coating layer and use it as barrier parts for these gas molecules. And then uh, after the experiment, we got very good results, I, I think, because with increasing nanocellulose content, we can see that the barrier properties for oxygen and water vapor, okay, it got decreased in the same level or comparable to conventional packaging material like PET or OPP with high barrier. And also the surface properties. It can resist them to water and also oil absorption. With this um, interesting um, yeah, resource, we also uh, shared about this nano composite coating, sustainable coating to another company. Uh, SEG packaging, and they seem to happily listen to it. So this is the conclusion slide of our joint project. I would say it's not that we just did many experiments to get many results. It's not. We also show a new route of how to use this agricultural waste turn them into semi product or pulp. So no need to burn them, reduce carbon dioxide emission, PM 2.5, extra money for this Thai farmer. Okay, and the pulp here, look, can fabricate them into new fully recyclable product, any green product. And then with this product distribute into our society, so it, it will help to reduce plastic waste and raise awareness in Thai society, in our community. And after this product is used, it can be thrown away with this card, but, but nothing will happen because it will decompose and then go back to nature. So this new route of circular economy. Myself, I believe it can be, it can make reality in three to five years with the long-term impact of good health and well-being of Thai people, with new innovation industry in our home and sustainable community. 
to drive a new valuable valuable supply chain and drive BCG Thailand forward. And all of this will not be happening without the funding and the support. So, so I appreciate very much the Newton Fund from British, British Council and support all law. And also our industrial partner, SCGP and Basu Company. Last but not least, my team, my colleague, my students and my research assistant. So thank you. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Kapatan Khan. It's how should I say it's it's unbelievable because the project itself, and I'm and I'm, I'm not just mentioning this to your projects, but also the other two projects that presented earlier as well. You all have just got the grant. How long was it? It's only been a year. And I think the outputs, the outcomes that you've managed to produce within this short amount of time, especially during the COVID lockdown, it's very unbelievable how much you have managed to achieve. So, so props to you on that, Kapazan Khan, and also to Ajahn Pongkip and Ajahn Tan Tawan as well. I really do appreciate how much you've been working so hard for, for this. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to see that the progress has been, you know, been continuing and you've been pushing this forward despite a lot of the difficulties. Um, my question to you here, so, so you did mention that the, you are now reaching out to different companies, to SCG, packaging to different um, smaller companies in, in Chiang Mai as well, uh, trying to like commercialize, essentially commercialize the, the, the projects. Do you think, are there any challenges that might hinder you from making this a reality? And if so, what's the likely timeline? <laughs> um. Okay, thank you for the question because actually it it is what we are facing the challenge because um I'm I'm struggle how to make it into reality <laughs> right now <laughs> with the small company the problem is the the money the investment with the big company again is the problem about um negotiation, how are we going to do this, how we can push this forward and make everybody happy. So um, I think I'm still in learning process, how to push this into reality. Bang. Okay. Sure. I mean, we'll, we'll keep you in discussion where if there's any related opportunities, but, but I do wish you the best of luck with, you know, going, going forward. And I mean, I, I, I don't know if there may be something that the UK could also contribute to, to on this occasion to about how they commercialize their, 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 their research. And it would be interesting to see how, how Queen Mary does this and, and how Mephalum University is also does this. And I'll, I'll be looking forward to, to hear more from, from your projects come into the future. I'll try to discuss more with, with the, my partner because they, they talk about spin-off company, they talk about startup, and they talk about uh, how to work with the company. So it would be a great help from them I, I, because they have much more experience than I have. Yeah, all right. It's great to hear. Well, wish you the best of luck, Kap. So thank you very much, Kapat and Gan, for your presentation. Unfortunately, because of the time, I will keep this to just one question for you. Um, right. So thank you, Kapat Um I will now move on to the next uh, speaker. So may I please call, call upon our next speaker, please. Um, um, Dr. Shanikan Wong Wiriya Wong Kap from King Mungkut University of Technology, Thonburi. And so Dr. Shanikan is a grant recipient under the Leaders in Innovation Fellowship, or LIF, that is delivered by the Royal Academy of Engineering in partnership with the NSTDA and her work, Eat Lab, Software for maximizing food products. Atan Shanikan Kap, if you are ready, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you see my screen now. Great. So um, mine could take on a slightly different uh, flavor than the other talks. So um, bear with me on that. Um, so Eat Lab, I built a startup company. It's called Eat Lab as a spin-off from university, Kim UTT. Um, so we built marketing tools for restaurants using AI. Um, just wanted to share a little bit about my journey 
um, how I got started and where LIF was part of it. Um, 2012, I graduated from MIT with a PhD and uh, was pretty much influenced by the whole concept of exponential technology. And then actually in 2012, I started my first company called Matternet, um, which we built logistics uh, network of drones that serve as um, roads for places without them. Um, and then, you know, I was offered a job at Harvard Medical School, but I decided to come back to Thailand and uh, was work working in the government post for a while. Um, didn't think that was my thing. So I left and um, being... Um, a Thai scholar myself, I, I incurred about a million dollar debt, which I paid off um, by trading, um, taking someone else's money to trade and make some money out of it. And then after that, I quit um, and to build my own startup, which is now Eat Lab. Uh, we were supported um, very early stage by LIF to um, learn about how to build companies. Um, that's definitely something that I'm not that familiar with I'm I've been I've been involved in like ideation phase and kind of like POC type of phase but not like growing companies and learning about different landscapes and of course in different countries is very 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 different building companies in Thailand um, I'm sure a lot of people can attest building startups in Thailand a lot of people can probably attest to how difficult it might be in terms of talent um, uh, that's not one of them, but, you know, like resource, very constrained. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of capital that went into seed stage companies. That's one of the big problems. If you guys want to solve, I could advise on many things like regarding that. So many companies die um, during that phase. Actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about that too in the next slide. Um, how we were walking through the valor of death a couple of times um, and how we kind of survived them. Um, hopefully, um, still not out of it, still in it, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, we were supported by Singapore government, which uh, was, you know, during a very crucial time when um, we weren't seeing at any light at the end of the tunnel. Um, LIF were kind of like at the very beginning where I was learning how to build companies and, you know, they really contribute in part of like understanding how to do that. Um, Singapore government um, kind of connect us to different industry partners so we can begin to experiment with our solutions like in ways that are more iterative um, and then I applied to Y Combinator which got accepted in the first round and uh, you know pivot my solution um, and became what's Eat Lab right now. Um, so I had to educate my team about like startups because uh, people who were in my company kind of joined, didn't know what startup was and, you know, that we had to go through like periods of a lot of suffering and like, you know, um, these like walking down the valley of death gets deeper and deeper and deeper until a point when you actually rise above. Um, and the process in which you go down this road is very important. Um, so I, I took this from the, oh, I'll come in and show. Okay. Anyway, so hopefully we're actually on the, on the tipping point, like kind of inflection point to go above, but we're not there yet. Um, the idea is that, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, stop me if, you know, in between, I don't make any sense, but I'll just share uh, one of the things that I've, one of the many things that I've learned um, was really how could we discover a new market? Uh, discovering new market, it's like um, going from zero to one. So Peter Thiel wrote about that um, in his book, which I religiously follow um, and ended up you know, discovering this um, contrarian truth. So in his book, um, there was a thesis about, you know, great, great companies were built upon discovering markets that didn't exist before. So I'm sure actually in Thailand, there's a lot of undiscovered market um, just because of the lack of efficiency in many things, um, which could be seen as a good thing. It's all like business opportunities. Um, but, you know, restaurant owners or oh, running restaurant business seems like something that's easy for Thai people to do. You know, it's like we cook well, um, we have sources of, 
you know, raw materials that are very fresh, very cheap. So opening restaurants should be something that's easy. That's what most, most people think. But in fact, it's very, very, very difficult. So that's the thesis in which I'm building my company upon um, is that I believe something that's opposite from what normal people would believe. Um, um, and that, that kind of level of difficulty has exacerbated over the past few years because of COVID. Um, COVID didn't make like running restaurant business harder. It just makes people wanting to open more restaurant business. Like if that makes sense, it actually does not. And it should not make sense. Like the fact that it's very hard and that a lot of people are still jumping in, right? It should not be like that. But it is the status of the current landscape at the moment. We have 230% increase in number of restaurant establishment in the past two years in Thailand. And I'm sure that number is not that much different, like across the world. People were out of jobs, like open restaurants. Um, they can now, they don't have to have a whole lot of capital to actually open their own restaurants. There's no infrastructure investment as much as like, you know, your own kitchen and like, you know, all the all the uh, raw materials that you need to go into making the food. Um, competition is higher than ever. Um, all these people know how to use online tools because they have to in order to survive. And the fact that they're running restaurant business on their own, they don't have a whole lot of time to deal with every kind of problems that may arise along the way, you know, dealing with suppliers, um, doing the shopping, like making marketing campaigns, um, checking the stocks and everything. It's just like from a very large scale business, but condensed into like under a few people. So that's a problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and a lot of people were really like looking for solutions. So this page actually grew 300% within the past two years. A lot of people were like influxing into like all these like ways to improve themselves so that they could become more efficient in the way that they work. But, uh, you know, information is one thing, right? But actually implementing those information in the way that you work on a daily basis as part of the system, it's what's missing. And that's where Eat Lab comes in. So we are marketer for restaurants using AI. Uh, we come up with strategy for restaurants. We place the, the marketing campaigns where it needs to be in order to activate the users. Um, so anything from like aware, um, not not from awareness, but like if the customers are already in, in grab food um, and looking at that restaurant from that point on, we maximize chances of conversion and um, increasing average check and frequency of, of coming back. So behind all of that, so actually statistical models um, that we run um, like AI models that constantly learn how to do predictions and exploration better. Um, that was like behind this was the gist of it. Um, but we built into a rest, uh, into a software um, as a, you know, like an online platform. So our customers can sign up, look for us, subscribe and connect. Right now, you know, we, we haven't done any marketing um, on our product. We're still a little bit under the, the you know, the radar. We're a bit in a stealth mode. So um, in this process, like preparing to really launch um, together with our partner. And um, I mean, we've launched once, we've launched like many times, but this next launch will be a little bit different than the past. And um, yeah, it will um, be like full integration with POS, full integration with Grab Food um, and payment um, companies. So the kind of impacts that we deliver to our customers are that we help them save time. Um, typically, you know, a restaurant, a typical restaurant owner, um, like small and medium size, they have to do everything like from hiring to like, purchasing to um, salary to, you know, pretty much everything. It's like running your own company, um, but you don't have a whole lot of tools. So um, if we, you know, kind of offload the work of marketer into the software, that they don't have to do anything with it except for like checking their P&L, like, you know, how it's improving. And then eventually they realize like, you know, the fact that they don't have to put in a lot of work into this software, but that actually re their revenue begins to grow. 
And we saw that over the past nine months, um, our product has been launched for 12 months. Um, the past nine months, we see a lot of revenue growth um, in our customers' um, daily revenue. So an average, it's actually 75%, but median of 37%. Um, it's it might surprise you that no one has done it before. Uh, kind of surprised me too. But um, yeah, um, it's one of that, that area. So you can listen to a case studies. I'll turn on a, a closed captioning so you can read in English. จริงๆการทำร้านอาหารตอนนี้นะคะมันไม่ใช่แค่เราต้องมีเงินทุนเยอะตอนนี้มันคือปลาเร็วกินปลาช้าเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยเฮ้ยทำยังไงก็ได้ให้ลีนที่สุดและเร็วที่สุดชื่อต้องปอนรัฐนาสามสินนะคะปัจจุบันทำอยู่ที่บันนาลีนะคะเป็นร้านอาหารไทยปัจจุบันตอนนี้มี4สาขาค่ะเราเปิดมากว่า27ปีแล้วอะคะ่ะจะเน้นเป็นอาหารไทยที่สำหรับแฟมิลี่อะคะ่ะจริงๆการทำร้านอาหารนี่ปัญหาเยอะแยะมากๆไม่ว่าจะเป็นปัญหาเรื่องคนคุณภาพมาตรฐานต่างๆส่วนใหญ่รุ่นจะเป็นปัญหาจุกจิกแต่โควิดที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยเป็นการเจอปัญหาที่ใหญ่มากตอนแรกไม่รู้ว่าตอนที่ห้างปิดเราจะเจออะไรบ้างแล้วเราจะขายของยังไงเราผ่านมาได้โดยการที่เราปรับใหม่ทั้งหมดเราปรับวิธีการเราปรับโปรดักต์เราปรับพนักงานว่าเฮ้ยตอนนี้ลูกค้าเข้ามาไม่ได้เราต้องไปขอไปหาลูกค้าซึ่งเราก็มีการเพิ่มโปรดักต์เช่นเบรดี้ทุกคุกขึ้นมาหรือว่าส่งเสริมในแง่ของทางโปรโมชั่นเบรดี้มากขึ้นจริงๆเนี่ยเบรดี้เนี่ยเป็นสิ่งสำคัญที่ร้านอาหารทุกร้านจะต้องปรับตัวที่เราใช้มันแต่ยังไงก็ตามเนี่ยมีแค่เทคโนโลยีเดลิเวอรี่ก็ไม่พอใช่ไหมคะต้องคิดโปรโมชั่นเพื่อให้ attract ลูกค้าด้วยทําให้อีทแลบเนี่ยเข้ามาทํายังไงก็ตามให้ร้านอาหารสามารถอยู่รอดและทําให้ profit maximize ให้มากที่สุดตัวของอีทแลบก็มาแนะนําจับคู่ให้เพื่อให้เพิ่มยอดขายเพิ่มมีมูเพิ่มยอดต่อปีให้ได้ successful ทำให้รู้สึกว่าเออพอลองใช้แล้วลองเปิดใจได้กับเทคโนโลยีจริงยิ่งเดี๋ยวนี้ถ้าใครมีข้อมูลเยอะๆยิ่งทำให้เขา success เร็วขึ้นตอนนี้บรนาน,นี้ก็ใช้ตัว profit maximizer ค่ะเป็นโปรแกรมที่ช่วยคิดคำนวณโปรโมชั่นคำนวณว่าเมนูไหนควรจะขายช่วงไหนและเมนูไหนที่จะได้ profit margin ได้มากที่สุดแม้กระทั่งการจับคู่เมนูต่างๆที่จะทำให้ขายดีขึ้นตรงกลุ่มขึ้นพอหลังใช้ค่ะเราก็จะเห็นว่าถ้าสมมติเราทำตามที่ระบบแนะนำเรามาเนี่ยตัว profit margin ในเฉพาะเมนูพวกนี้ขึ้นกี่เปอร์เซ็นต์ชัดเจนจริงๆจะบอกว่าโลกตอนนี้ค่ะมันไม่ใช่ปลาใหญ่กินปลาเล็กนะคะมันเป็นปลาเร็วกินปลาช้าเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยเวลามันสำคัญที่สุดเมื่อว่าเราจะทำอะไรเนี่ยเราพยายามเซฟเวลาให้ได้มากที่สุดเพราะฉะนั้นการมี profit maximizer เมนูตัวนี้มันทำให้เราเซฟเวลาได้มากขึ้นและทำให้เราทำงานได้เร็วขึ้น efficient ขึ้นไม่ต้องลองผิดลองถูกว่าเราจะทำยังไงให้ลูกค้าติดหรือว่าทำยังไงให้ margin มันสูงขึ้นยึดแลปตอบสุดในการทำ profit maximizer จริงอ่ that's kind of the the you know one of our um, one of our customers who ended up being an investor into the company. But as a disclaimer, this video was recorded before she um, had expressed her interest in um, uh, investing into eLab. So we are actually a Series A company. Um, I just closed a round of about two million US um, um, just last month and. Um, you know, based on um, the traction that we had so far. Um, yeah, so this is an example of what we did, you know, with data to help improve restaurant revenue. Um, they actually didn't join us because they wanted to increase their revenue. It's just like they need help. They need people to actually offload some of the work. But because we begin to saw a lot of uptake in their revenue, we decided to change our business model instead of like charging a subscription fee. Now we actually take a cut of their revenue. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, the companies that are also um, benefiting greatly, we begin to see things like two to six X of revenue that went up. Um, I'm not claiming that entirely it's because of us, but they also include the kind of like, you know, the front part of the marketing funnel to drive more awareness into the, the restaurants. But once the customer 
gets into the restaurants, we help them maximize the revenue um, from there on and frequency of purchase. This is our team. Um, I myself up here, uh, we have a CTO who's an, an ex um, Silicon Valley. He was working as one of the leading team members in machine learning um, engineering at Apple. Um, you know, we were colleagues in um, MIT and he has a PhD in physics. Um, and another guy who's um, who joined us as a COO was also man like product manager at one of the banks in Thailand, uh, was ex Silicon Valley and um, yeah, also uh, very smart guy. Um, this is our team of advisors, um, Professor Cherry Kimes, um, who sits on the board of many start startups, including Olo, which um, not recently, but IPO like a couple of years ago. Um, and she teaches revenue management, which is what we do, but in restaurant industry. Um, so she connected me to these two who are also amazing individuals and have greatly helped me um, along the way with that mentorship. Um, I think I think that's about it um, about Eat Lab. I think I've been talking a lot. It would probably better to take questions, but this is um, our line ad. So um, if you know anyone who's running restaurants and need help, they can sign up. We have some software that actually they can use it for free forever with no strings attached. Um, they can use that to like help them do marketing more effectively. Um, and we have a list of partners who are cross from like CO, um, POS, CRM, like um, marketing agencies, like, you know, product development, sales and suppliers and banks. Um, so currently we have about a team of um, included, uh, including partners into the team, about 70 developers to build the product and planning to go to market, um, you know, with this new launch in June. So thank you so much. Okay, yeah, thank you fun. very much, Kapadan Chanika. Uh, okay, so we do have a questions from the floor. So, so at first, so, so this is um, from someone on, on the floor. Um, amazing journey. So, so Eat Lab has ev had ever collaborated with large, com large private companies. What happened? What is the difference with applying Eat Lab with large food companies versus restaurants? What yeah, was yeah. That, that? Would you like to take these two questions first? And then sure. I'll, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll, I'll, it's one of the two pivots that we did. Um, in fact, the first pivot was uh, we were working initially with um, food manufacturing companies, um, you know, like FMCGs. And what we found was that the cycle of iterations was very long. Um, you know, they're not adjusting their product as fast as they should be. Um, so, you know, for us um, to be in that cycle and running enterprise sales is definitely won't scale to the way that it has you know to its full potential so um, and of course that showed in the lack of sales that came through e lab so then we decided to um, improve what we have and we had a restaurant which we were running tests on right um, with all these different products um, so after like opening that running restaurants, like we begin to realize there's a lot of problems that happen in the restaurant. So we begin to use our data, you know, to understand what consumer wants. We were running different like A-B testing <laughs> on our consumers. And then we were able to improve our revenue by three times in five months. And um, that was like an eye-opening thing for us. And we just went out to talk to like restaurant owners, like, like a large corporate, but they didn't seem to actually have the kind of tools that we do either. So then they wanted to use our tools. So we begin to sell to MK, S&P, um, and all those big brands like Minor, um, Central Restaurant Group, um, like Oishi Group, and then we became profitable. But um, after applying to Wacom, I actually switched gear again. So we drop all those enterprise account and focus on small and medium sized. So those are the two kind of pivots that happen in the company. I mean, there were difficult decisions. The second one, because of course you were sacrificing your profit for like, you know, I used to charge him like a contract was like in million baht, right? But now I'm charging SMEs for like hundreds, you know, and now it's like free. So... <laughs> 
So um, it was a difficult decision to make, but the purpose of the company was really to help like small people. Anyway, so I just I just went with it, but it just turns out that there actually is a business opportunity within it that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, I think also um, I, I would completely agree with the second question. So I think based on, on what you've been mentioning, data and big data is indeed a very big thing and there's going to be a lot of opportunity. So linking back to the questions that we have from the floor, uh, what is your view on the future of AIs and startup, including competition, saturation and opportunities, if you could comment on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I'll speak only from my experience. I I'm no um, a futurist of any sort. I can't predict the future, but um, I know what's missing um, in the ecosystem in Thailand. Are we talking about Thailand or like just like in general? Should we like because I I could like rant Th for hours about Thailand. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's it's Thailand. Thailand. Oh, okay, okay. Um, don't worry about competition. 80% uh, of the companies, even AI companies um, that gets funding, struggle to launch the product to consumers. So it's not an, it's not like AI is the answer to everything. Um, because even if it is, like 80% of people still can't get the product to customers. Um, I, I could probably share how we did that um, um and you know before that 80 percent were like i don't know like maybe five like one percent or like five percent of companies that actually get substantive enough seed funding that makes them survive the valley of death so um, you do the number it's barely like existent i think it's very hard in thailand um but that opportunity will be changed drastically if we could pull a lot of like seed funding and inject into these like little companies that were raising like Sam San, Ling Lan Baht, you know, like a million baht of like seed capital. That's like not enough, you know, you just burn it in like a couple of months. Um, even if you, you only live on ramen or something, you know, that's still very difficult because you need to do a lot of experimentation. But there's opportunities in this country um, and regarding food, you know, we're talking about food and like circular economy, green economy, like Thailand is the hub. So if we were to do any in invention, like to have any invention or innovation that comes out and become big worldwide, it has to be in this sector. And it's, there's not enough attention in it in terms All of right. capital. Yeah. Money okay. solves a lot of problems, guys. Yeah. Okay, um, I think um, so. We've been hearing quite quite a lot from from the research side of things, um, and but but for your case, as an your yours was kind of like more at the end, downstream. Um, I, I understand a lot of the audience here. A majority of them are would be researchers and academics. Mm -hmm. Could you please share possibly some 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 tips I I get or like advice on how you know researchers could try and move towards that that, you know, changing from, from research to actually commercializing research. What, what are your tips and your thoughts? Right. Um, I think I could talk about them like in a two separate tracks. Um, there will be one track like biotech, you know, um, for those, you really need to like make your technologies like super good and then like, you know, um, potentially collaborate with big corporations that will take it to market or um, raise a whole lot of funding, which will not happen in Thailand. Like I emphasize will not happen in Thailand in like probably within the next 10 years. Like they don't see that. Um, so if anyone were to invest like 10 million US or like 20, 50 million US into a seed um, company, it would not happen like from Thai capital to Thai company. That was not like something that unless you're like, you know, you win like um, a Nobel Prize something and then like some um, companies in Thailand will, will, will pay um, attention. I, I don't have any experience with that. But from my experience, um, from like this software innovation, which doesn't need a whole lot of capital to start, um, you don't even have to think about transitioning. You just start like you just build a company 
you just start a company. It's not that you have to think like, these are what I have to do to start a company. No, you just start a company. And then along the way, you will tumble, you'll learn, you'll grow. Um, you surround yourself with your peers um, that will help you um, like figure it out. It sounds like a very vague process. Um, I could share two books to read, which had helped me along the way because I honestly have no peers. Uh, when I build this company, um, I learn from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I pretty much learned from Y Combinator. Um, there is like startup school on um, resources online. Um, the, you know, that book I mentioned from zero to one, if you follow it religiously, I believe you can discover something amazing. Um, Peter Thiel, zero to one. And the second book I'm reading, it's called Blitz Scaling. Um, it's by, by Reed Hoffman, the founder and CEO of LinkedIn. Uh, so he talks about, you know, some of, the, you know, the concept of scaling fast and when to scale fast and when not to scale fast and what are the strategies and some of the mechanisms that are involved in setting up the companies in ways that will allow you to dominate the market forever. Um, I mean, that definition of forever, it's like whatever, like 10 years, like 50 years, but, you know, like Google and Facebook kind of dominate the market like we feel like it's been forever but it's only like the past 10 years yep okay thank you very much Kap Azan. it's been quite a very insightful presentation look getting to know to, to know it labs and I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of the takeaways uh, for for the audience to learn so once again thank you for for your presentation so because of the timing i unfortunately will have only that much time for q a so thanks for this and then I will be moving forward to our next session. Okay, so for the next session, this will no longer be all about the Newton Fund, uh, but rather this is a project taking place that has just been completed very recently. And this is the foresight into the BCG economy project supported um, by the Foodinopolist here. Uh, and here we do have two speakers. So first of all, first of all, we'll be hearing more first from uh, Dr. Eganom Zengboa from Foodinopolis, and later we'll be hearing from Dr. Kenisha Garnett from Cranfield Hughes University to talk through about what the project is all about, what's the key output. So Dr. Ekap, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, also, good morning to uh, my co-presenter, uh, Kenisha from uh, the UK. Um, I will be sharing about um, this project uh, and the first part, and let me uh, pop up my slide. Okay. Do you see the screen? Okay, so the, um, the last uh, topic or talk for this session is that uh, the future of food and uh, for site collaboration in the food sectors uh, between uh, Foodinopolis and UK. So actually the project between uh, our partner in UK, which is Cranfield University, where the uh, help of uh, Brisk Council is the uh, uh, University Industry Link project, which uh, we started in uh, 2019. And uh, at that time we uh, worked together for six months and then we uh, have a five day workshop on foresight for food. Uh, we having at that time, I think about 40 uh, people with the two consultants, Kanisha and uh, Simon, uh, come over to Thailand for five days at Khao Yai. So we um, open applications for um, researchers and also uh, industry sectors. But at that time, I would say uh, the majority of the workshop are from uh, universities and mostly from food and food related. And uh, also pretty much on the, um, those are from uh, universities that join Foodinopolis as a Foodinopolis network. So um, back in 2019, we were working on um, the strategies of uh, Food industry in Thailand. That's pretty much on the on the on the, the big topic on on the things that we discussed during the the five days, which I think Kanisha will uh, maybe touch upon foresight methodology a little bit. What what we have done uh, during the workshop, 
Um, and actually that uh, in 2019, we got quite uh, very good um, output and outcomes and we would like to further on the project by uh, next years. But then when we start to discuss, then the, we hit with the pandemic. So um, we couldn't do the project in 2020s and also in uh, 2021, uh, second half of the year, we start uh, again with risk council and uh, we would like to uh, come back with the project with the second project with Cranfield. So um, through our difficulties working in the pandemic and uh, we lucky enough to uh, have the workshop on site workshop again in uh, just uh, mid of this month, two weeks ago in Phuket. So uh, the this time, consultant Simon Kanisha, and uh, we also have Braun from uh, Cranfield University uh, to come. And uh, back in 2019, we have five days workshop, but this time we split it. Uh, so we take the opportunities of, uh, we kind of familiar with doing things online. So we uh, have the first day and second days of the workshop the orientation and kind of introduce uh, the participants to get to used to the foresight tools uh, online. And then we have the on-site workshop on a 16, 13, uh, oh, sorry, 16, 17, and then 18 of uh, March in Phuket, where all three consultants have to uh, come and then test and go, and lucky enough, they can go. <laughs> Uh, so, um, during the workshop, we kind of um, have this time we have about, I think, almost 60 participants and we have um, engaged uh, five key stakeholders um, comprising of um, the policy maker. We have uh, TSRI and uh, Nexpo joining with us and also the knowledge providers, which uh, uh, majorities, I would say about 40% um, of the uh, all participants are uh, from universities, uh, from FI network uh, universities, and also the researchers. And also we have uh, in with, um, industry as well, the uh, uh, private sectors and others, public sector also join us uh, having food inopolis as the intermediary. So um, at this time, the project is uh, for site for for site into the BCG economies and um, into the food and agriculture series. We call it series because we uh, when we start the project and we learn it from from the previous uh, project in uh, 2019 that we have to prepare the participants because the participants they're not quite familiar with with the tools and uh, methodology. So Budinopolis, um have uh, another workshop uh, separately just before um, the workshop in March. We have the workshop on site together with the selected participant in Pattaya for two days. So get them ready, get them prepared um, so that we can make use of the three days uh, together with the consultants. And um, what I would uh, show you a little bit of uh, output outcome of the project. So during the foresight uh, workshop three days, we uh, come up with this uh, five key driver for uh, Thai future food industries. So the drivers that come at the top five uh, are climate change, health consciousness, uh, policies, direction, and also food technology and food securities. So we have a lot of uh, data in our um, basket right now. So what, what next with us, with the team of Food Innopolis, um, and uh, together with the help of the consultant, we have to uh, refine all those data and uh, come up with uh, vision and strategies for Thai food uh, industry. And um, I would say that uh, the outcome of this project, that uh, what we have uh, achieved is uh, improve the foresight skill of the participants and also from uh, intermediary like Food Innopolis as well. 
and we see the progress in learning uh, both in individuals and also in team in peer learning. And um, what is the benefit the most is the feedback from the consultant. So um, the consultant help us to to see the future future of uh, food industry in Thailand, uh, both in terms of um, strategic um, issues for um, research and innovation, and also uh, the challenge for the food industry. And they help us to see the futures and. Um, Kind of guide us how to make that future happen, and also we uh, will have to um, develop the roadmap as I mentioned, uh, because Food Inopolis is the strategic agenda team for um, TSRI in uh, food uh, and uh, future food industry. So we will use the data information from this workshop to uh, work further. Uh, as the strategic agenda team for um, TSRI. And um, right after the workshop, we had the workshop on a three days workshop and we have a break in between uh, weekend, Saturday, uh, Sunday, where our consultant can rest a little bit uh, while they also have to uh, summarize and prepare for um, the dissemination of the project results. So on Monday, uh, we uh, have this um, event, which is actually, uh, if uh, any of you interest to uh, watch the event, it's still, it's still on uh, Facebook of uh, TSRI. So during the, the session, we have Ron uh, talk about the future scenario of food and agriculture system, which is very much interesting. And also, we also have TSRI uh, discuss about STI policy and strategies. Uh, for Thailand food research and innovation. Um, Foodinopolis, Dr. Akrawit also discussed about the project and um, also Kanisha and, and Simon uh, also share uh, their thoughts on uh, working with us and uh, during the, uh, the whole project and also the, in particular the three day workshop and what next. And also at the end of the um, this um, event, this uh, dissemination uh, event, we also have the roundtable discussion uh, about the from policy to implementation and the way forward. So I think um, it would be very much interest uh, to to just uh, go back and visit the, the website of TSRI and uh, see um, the record of the event. So I think I will hand over to Kanisha to uh, tell you more about uh, this collaboration and then maybe we'll be back at the end to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so just to moving quickly on, so maybe I'd like to, to call over um, Kanisha if you'd like to take over on talking about the project results. Hey, good morning. Uh, very good morning to you, Dr. Raki Anong. Uh, lovely to see you. Uh, Bank at the British Council. Uh, very, very nice to see you and, and to, to participants as well. A warm uh, good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. It's, it's morning for us, but afternoon for you. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here um, and thanks very much for, for the invitation. Um, Dr. Aki Anong has done a fantastic job in, in summarizing uh, the, the project and it's taken uh, taken a, a, away um, the need for me to kind of reinforce the objectives, uh, etc. So I'll I'll spend a lot more time talking you through the kind of methods that we uh, introduce participants to at the workshop. Um, before I do that, maybe I should introduce myself and, and Cranfield uh, as an institution. So uh, my name is Kanisha Garnett. Um, I'm a foresight expert, um, an academic uh, based at Cranfield University. We have a very long kind of history in, in, in building foresight tools, uh, implementing them, working with organizations. Uh, a lot of those organizations are government organizations, such as the European Commission, um, UK government agencies as well, uh, Food Standards Agency in the UK, uh, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, um, the Environment Agency, uh, uh, to name a few. Um, and we've worked actively with these organizations in embedding foresight as, as part of their policy process. Um, we haven't quite <laughs> managed to, um, to, 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 to deliver a, a, a seamless 
uh, process for embedding for foresight tools, but it is a, a work in progress. Um, and it was really a, a pleasure to continue um, a, a very long history of work with um, the British Council, uh, Foodinopolis, uh, in terms of introducing foresight tools uh, to, to the Thai policy context, uh, as well as um, uh, so Thai policy organizations, but also Thai academics and, and, and broader uh, industry collaborators as well. Um, so myself, uh, Dr. Simon Jude and, and Professor Ron Kersanji at Cranfield University uh, spent a, a, a few days, um, uh, roughly five days, um, some of some of that time online um, and, and some of that time in residence uh, in, in Phuket, uh, working with a very wide range of, of stakeholders or participants. So policymakers, um, funding organizations, so UK, uh, TSRI, um, working with academics, um, also um, participants from, from the food industry. Um, and the, the main aim really was to increase the kind of knowledge and skills in, in using foresight. Uh, foresight for, for, for the participants here today who are a little bit possibly un, unfamiliar with foresight. Foresight essentially is a suite of tools, um, and I'll introduce you to some of those tools shortly, but a suite of tools that just enables organization to be a little bit mindful about the operation and operational environment in which they, they exist. Um, and, and be aware, become a, a, a lot more aware of how that environment is changing, um, what change uh, is presented as a threat to the organization or a challenge, or, or whether that change presents a, an opportunity. So it's, it's really about being mindful about how the environment, external environment to the organization is changing um, and how that change can present either opportunities or, or challenges for the organization in terms of, of how it develops. So foresight really is a strategic planning tool. It's about looking towards the future um, and, and being very mindful about uh, modeling or anticipating how change will affect the future direction of the organization. Um, and that's a very, very simplified explanation, but I'll, I'll, I'll introduce some of the tools shortly. So the workshop really introduced these tools to, to participants and with the intention to build their awareness and their knowledge in applying this, these two uh, in a policy uh, context. Um, it was a very participatory process. Foresight is often a very systematic, but very participatory process. So it, it, it requires the involvement um, and the active participation of a significant uh, a, 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 and a very broad range of individuals. Um, and the, the purpose of the, the workshop at Phuket, as Dr. Akienong um, earlier mentioned, was really to, to think through um, how Thai food industry is, is developing um, and, and really think about that in the looking at the potential to make the transition to a biocircular green economy. So how can Thai uh, food industry become much more circular in nature? Um, and inherently much more sustainable. And this is an ambition not only within Thailand, because we've been working with other organizations, such as the European Commission, to think through the implications of a, of a broader circular economy or green economy. So this is a, a global ambition for many countries. Uh, so we, we, we work to introduce tools to help think through that vision for Thailand, but also to think about how you deliver that vision, so the roadmap that pathway to implementing the vision. Um, and then as Dr. Aki Hanong also mentioned, um, we were then tasked to disseminate some of the, the thinking that happened in the workshop. Uh, so communicate the outputs to a wider range of aud uh, audience uh, or a broader audience. Um, and the idea then is to support the kind of decision-making that will follow uh, with this workshop. Um, and, and hopefully that, that kind of leads to, to joint action amongst, a various, amongst various stakeholders. So what was involved in the workshop? Um, there's a, a few highlights to share with you. Um, and I'm also going to kind of touch on some of the tools that we introduced as part of this foresight exercise. Um, so the first step really was to work with participants, and this was following on the preparatory work that Foodinopolis had already done 
uh, with the participants um, and supported by us, obviously. So the first step was to really think about that operational environment, that external environment, and think about how the landscape for food and agriculture in Thailand was changing and whether that change presented opportunities or challenges for, for the Thai, Thai sector. And we thought about Thailand not only at a national level, but its position within the Asian context uh, or the um, Asian Pacific region. And then even broader than that, their international position. Um, so thinking about how the Thai food brand can, can, can grow to a, a much more global brand as well. So the things that we, we, we covered in, in this particular part of the workshop was really to work with participants to proactively scan, think about the future development of, of the food and agricultural landscape in Thailand um, and think about what presented a challenge either within the food uh, sector or also the kind of nexus that exists between food and agriculture. So thinking from farm to fork almost um, and, and the whole system as, 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 a, as a kind of a holistic approach. We were working with participants to think beyond what exists currently. So some of the current challenges are, are very clear. You know, the, the idea that climate change is, is creating a lot of pressure on, on farm systems uh, to be much more resilient. So the interest in regenerative agriculture, for example, these are, are already developments that are quite current. But we were really working with participants to think beyond uh, the current system and think about the future. What what is the potential for transfer um, transitioning to more regenerative agriculture uh, in the future? Um, what were some of the kind of consumer behavior that was very evident now? You know, the pandemic has really increased consumers' awareness about the, the need to be healthy um, and the, the role that food plays in increasing our ability to be a, a, a lot more resilient to um, diseases such as the pandemic. So that health consciousness, as Dr. Aki Yanong mentioned as a key driver, was, is really shaping that, that desire for more nutritious food. And Thai is well positioned to deliver food that is a lot more nutritious and meet requirements for wellness, for example. So thinking about patterns that really will define the, the future trajectory of, of Thai food. Um, and we did that by examining current trends and thinking about how those trends will exist in 10, 20, or even beyond 20 years time. So um, the long term, we were really forcing participants to think beyond 20 years. So which is quite challenging because often there is a, there is a lot of uncertainty about what will happen in the next five years, much less 20 years. So um, it, it's often very difficult for participants to, you know, to, to think real long term. Um, and then amongst the kind of patterns that we observed and we were just debating and discussing, and there was real kind of experts in the room that had real key knowledge about developments within the food system. So um, that conversation was very rich and very enlightening. Um, and a big learning ground for us as UK consultants as well, we, we got introduced to quite a few drivers that for us was, was were quite new. And we, we work with lots of organizations who think through the food system and developments within the food system. Um, and it, it, it was inherently a, a, an enlightening conversation. So we, we, we focus a lot on what was desirable uh, amongst those trends, um, what was really opportunities for, for the Thai context, the Thai food context, um, and what was realistic and, and achievable within the time horizon that we were, we were looking out towards, so beyond 20 years. Um, and then also thinking through some of the challenges and opportunities with different stakeholders within the, the food system. So farmers uh, who weren't well represented at, at the workshop, um, but participants being very aware of, of the difficulties and challenges for farmers, actually giving them a voice in discussions as well. The second step, once we've got a, a good handle on what's changing and what's desirable in terms of long term uh, growth, was to develop the vision of what, what is the kind of common objectives for transforming the Thai food industry. Um, and what what was considered conceived to be value added for a range of stakeholders 
um, so from, from farm to fork, but also thinking about the national um, policy context, the national priorities for that transition to a biocircular green economy, um, and making that transition as inclusive as possible so that nobody is left behind. So we were really keen to, to drive home that you know, national thinking through the, the developments of within the food system, but aligning it um, to the broader kind of national uh, priorities. So we work with participants really to, to think about um, to think about stakeholder needs, to think about the aspirations for the future, multiple stakeholder needs, so not limiting or narrowing the frame to um, just policy, um, uh, um, policy priorities, but thinking broadly about uh, the needs of, of other key actors within the food system. So uh, small to medium sized enterprises who uh, have a dominant presence within the, the Thai food industry, um, farmers, as, as, as mentioned, but also those uh, consumers who, who have certain um, particular needs and desires as well. Um, and then also thinking through the national priorities. So we work actively with participants to, to think through what that long term ambition and that vision for, for a transition to a, a BCG or biocircular green economy, uh, what that looks like. Um, Supporting the vision is thinking through the pathway for implementing that vision. So once we had the vision and we had about seven groups that developed independent, independently their idea of what the future vision uh, looks like. Um, uh, once we had that, we, we then had to actively work with those groups to think through the pathway or the roadmap towards that vision, to implementing that vision or to um, actually achieving that vision. So the roadmap was very much about identifying the kind of strategic objectives, the common strategic objectives for accelerating change, thinking through what is feasible, what is desirable, but yet feasible within the Thai context, um, identifying what constitutes impact, what will deliver that long term ambition for uh, developing Thai food um, into a global brand for wellness. Um, that was a, a clear uh, goal within uh, the vision that was identified by one particular group, just, just as an example. Um, how do you deliver the impact uh, embedded in that vision? And then how do you prepare for that? So the roadmap is very much about thinking through the kind of collaborations needed, the networks um, that needed, needed to be put in place, the funding mechanisms to help with tech innovation, um, thinking through how you work with consumers, you build awareness about the nutritional value of Thai food. Um, you think through things such as food safety and kind of regulations, global regulations, and how that would change moving forward and how Thai food can be positioned um, well to deal with such, such challenges. Um, what are the threats? What are the potential opportunities uh, that exist? And then obviously, recognizing that you can't do everything and there, there needs to be trade-offs um, and thinking how those trade-offs were, were or can be achieved by balancing multiple priorities. Always be being aware of the desire for thinking through more inclusive growth and development. So equitable benefits being um, a, clear, a clear priority um, that was kind of resonating through, through the discussions at the workshop. So just to give you a, a little bit of a, um, a flavor of, of uh, some of the output, and I'll minimize here so that hopefully you can see the screen well on, on, on your end. Um, so we had seven different groups, each producing their own vision for the Thai food industry. So that to the right of the screen, you can see those seven visions. Um, and there is a job now, as, as Dr. Akianong mentioned, um, for Foodinopolis, um, and, and NASDA to, to start to reconcile these different visions, um, take it out to a broader stakeholder group um, and get it kind of critiqued and, and, and sense checked uh, with our support as well. So um, we've already started to think through how you connect the vision um, across the seven groups. And to the right, you'll see um, some key words that really resonate uh, uh, with the, the, the participants at the workshop in terms of, well, what does that vision for uh, the transition to a biocircular economy, what does that um, vision of, of a more circular food, food industry in Thailand look like for the next 20 years, 20 plus years? Um, and certain keywords are popping out here, creating new markets for green food products, um, 
pushing for this within a carbon free economy. So thinking about broader global ambitions uh, towards to move in, in terms of moving towards net zero. Um, so that is represented and very much reflected in the Thai vision. Uh, increasing competitiveness through um, innovation to enhance the wellness uh, uh, um, uh, or association of wellness with, with, with Thai food. Um, and then towards the bottom of the screen, which is really quite key, is the maximizing the value of local agri food products. So thinking through the kind of local Thai food that has lots of value, lots of potential, and thinking about how that can be escalated uh, to, to create a much more uh, global brand. And then very towards the very bottom also is thinking through this, this notion of an equitable food system. So not leaving anyone behind. So already you can start to see a, a vision, a clear vision emerging from the, the discussions at the workshop. But obviously this has to be uh, refined um, and, and, and further worked on uh, by, by Foodinopolis. But the workshop offers a really good foundation and the quality of the discussion, which for us was, was really illuminating, uh, has, has started to, to support that emergence of a, of a strong um, and really compelling vision for the Thai food industry. Um, so just a couple of minutes now to reflect on opportunities and challenges. Uh, ben, please do tell me if I'm running out of time and I'll, I'll speed up. Um, uh, there, there were a few challenges in the workshop. Uh, Dr. Akianong mentioned um, uh, the lack of familiarity with, with the foresight tools. And this is not just um, a, a case for Thailand. It's also a case for, for um, uh, organizations we work with in Europe, um, organizations we work with right here in the UK. So often there is a need for uh, orientation, uh, supporting participants ahead of a workshop like this, so that they're a lot more familiar with the tools. They're, they're a lot more familiar with the kind of mindset that's needed to think long term, to think about the future. Um, quite often it's, 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 it's quite a task to, um, and I use this phrase quite, quite loosely, it's, it's, it's a task to suspend disbelief, <laughs> thinking not only about what is you know, very much uh, visible and, and immediately obvious, so what we can observe now, um, and, and, and the ability to, to, to disengage from the here and now and think about what is relatively uncertain and what is very much difficult to see. Uh, and it's, it's the development of, of some of the, the, the signals of change that we see today, uh, the development of those for, for the future. It's very hard to do that. Um, and we are generally trained in an academic context not to do that, <laughs> not to, to engage with un uncertainty, but foresight requires us to, to engage with uncertainty and to navigate it, find tools to help us navigate that level of un uncertainty about the future. Um, so a couple of things that came out as real opportunities from the workshop, um, and there was lots of discussion about embedding foresight uh, tools with other decision support tools, such as risk assessment. Um, and this is really about helping organizations to really be a, a lot more, um, well, in, in their strategic planning process, to, to really be a lot more forward thinking and forward planning, and not too reactive, but much more pre proactive in thinking about the future and using these tools to help shape and carve a future out that is much more desirable, so you can actively work towards it. So. This is an area that we're working on uh, actively at Cranfield as well, thinking through how we embed foresight with other decision support tools so that it becomes much more natural uh, to think about the future while you are planning for your, um, or thinking about how your organization uh, develops in the future. Um, Thailand, what came out from the workshop for us was Thailand has really a fantastic cohort of foresight experts. We were blown away uh, by the level of thinking and the outcomes um, from the workshop. Um, and uh, moving forward, there is obviously a need to think through how we build confidence, confidence and in the use of foresight tool beyond the workshop, um, looking at other organizations, um, some of the individuals who we've already trained becoming the trainer, so train the trainer uh, as an approach, um, and how we can support, uh, there, there's a lot of skill in, in, in terms of running a, a workshop like this. It requires a, a lot of facilitation skills. Um, we have learned it as we've, as, as 
you know, we've delivered uh, copious amounts of workshops. Um, but that developing those facilitation skills are, are crucial um, to the success of uh, implementing uh, foresight as a, as a process. So facilitation of the participatory process of, you know, which inherently is, is running a workshop. Um, extending this foresight process to other BCG uh, sectors. So we focus primarily on the food and agricultural um, sector in, in thinking through how you make that transition to a biocircular economy. But there are other sectors that has been identified uh, by the Thai government as, as, as crucial um, to, to for this transition as well. Um, one example is the creative industries um, or cultural industries within Thailand, um, culture and, and, and tourism um, being at the forefront of the, the Thai economy. Uh, some challenges, and I'm only going to mention very much uh, a, a few because we, we've, we've talked about between Dr. Raki Anong and, and myself, we've talked about a few already. Um, some of the kind of tensions that exist um, between being visionary, but yet considering the kind of reality of what can be delivered in, in the, the short to, to the long term. Um, some, some participants struggled a little bit to disengage with the here and now and, and to really think long term. So we, we introduced a lot of exercises within the workshop to help them to be a lot more visionary. One of them being a, a particular um, uh, scenario where we uh, presented, we, we built a story actually um, at the start of the workshop and we're forcing participants to actually work in groups to, to add um, their own views on, on how the story was, 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 was being built. And it, that really exposed a certain level of thinking within the workshop, those who were much more sensory in their approach to thinking, and those who were, who were a lot more intuitive and could disengage quite easily. You, are, you actually need both sources of thinking in a, in a foresight exercise, um, but it helped us to reveal where we would have a, a few challenges within the, within the workshop setting. Um, another one that was quite uh, uh, useful to is quite useful to mention as a challenge um, was thinking through who to involve in, in these kinds of workshop. Um, often visions are often quite top down, but in, in effect they need to be bottom up as well as top down. Um, so always getting the right set of people in the room is is this important. At the workshop we had we had the top down we had policy representatives. Um, we had individuals who are on the ground, so within the, the food industry um, and delivering a lot of the, the, the kind of strategic objectives discussed. Um, we, we were missing those uh, representatives um, from small to medium sized uh, enterprises maybe, and, and from, from farms, um, for example. But as I said, there was a lot of thinking from participants in terms of well, how does this support, how will this support farmers? How will this support small to medium sized businesses, food businesses? So we, we did get that discussion, um, but having a, a good handle on, on who to involve in the workshop can, can also uh, be challenging. Um, policy aspects are very important, um, if not more important than the technology. Now, that, that's a really important statement. And you see from Dr. You, you, you've seen from Dr. Akin Nong's presentation that um, policy direction came up as one of the top five drivers. Um, that is really important because you take the leadership uh, element is, 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 is key in this. Uh, who's leading the way to this transition? Um, and, 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 and what are the mechanisms um, that are being provided or set at a policy level to enable um, other actors to, to follow? But also thinking through the, the bottom as well, thinking through the social aspects, uh, thinking through behaviors and how behaviors can, can be transitioned was really important. So it wasn't a, a, a workshop where we just overtly focused on technology. Technology is just one part of the solution, but we need a much more broader discussion around the, the policy mechanisms, around the kind of social behaviors, um, thinking through uh, the, the level of competitiveness. So the economy or economic aspects are also very important. So what are some of the kind of takeaway messages from the project? What, what, what have we learned? Um, uh, I think what one thing that we, we as, as consultants are taking away from this is, is 
uh, what, what we're learning as consultants is creating this creative space for active forms of, of, of engagement. We, we had a really good dynamic uh, within the workshop, um, and that is probably part and parcel because of the, 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 the great um, grouping of people that was put together for this event. But having that great kind of interaction between the facilitators and those who are actually in the room is really important and creating the right dynamics so that you are e eliminating um, power or hierarchical structures that may impede how people express themselves are, is really crucial for a workshop of this nature. Um, and that's, that's always a bit of a learning ground for us because as we work with different organizations um, in different countries and in, with, with different cultures, we always have to be quite aware of what's culturally appropriate, what, what are the sensitivities and how to, to build that dynamic. Um, so yeah, understanding also- Corruption. Sorry, can you share, just to let you know that the time's running out. Thank you. Okay then, thank you, thank you, Bank, thank you. So I'll be very, very quick, so moving on. Uh, a creative space for active in, 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 um, engagement is really important. Creating that agency for change. So thinking about what, what is possible. We thought about a vision, but what is possible to make that transition? So what, what is needed? And this is where tech, it's not all about technology, but it has to be about policy. It has to be about society and societal change as well. So that was really quite a, a big learning ground for us um, as well as you know thinking through that, that more holistic approach. Um, always kind of building an evidence base for foresight. Um, we're doing that. So, thinking through how we tailor foresight to fit the kind of cultural uh, and context for decision making in different countries. So this is giving us a, a real source of, um, uh, it's giving us a real great uh, evidence uh, base so that we can better tailor our tools, the tools that we use to support organizations in the future. Now we're, we're working actively, as I said, to link risk and foresight tools so that there is a much more seamless process in, in, in a policy context to make decisions that are much more about the long term. Um, and we're doing that by really trying to create a more cross fertilized um, approach between uh, risk assessors in organizations who are very important uh, in policy context but also those who are very much forward thinking and thinking about the future um, and, 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 and applying approaches that are, um, uh, are less uh, um, about the hard sciences. So how do we build a system where we integrate that kind of distributed source of knowledge um, and more cross-disciplinary uh, approaches? That's, that's the area for growth and, and future development. Um, and I think um, uh, our, our evidence base that we're building from implementing tools in various different organizations, various different um, cultural contexts, is really supporting how we do that well um, and how adaptable those tools are to different different organizations. So, without further ado, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Um, it's been a, a fantastic experience, and I really do look forward to continuing our work with with Foodanopolis, NASA, and the British Council. Thank you, Bank. Sorry, apologies for for running over. That's all right. Thank you very much, Kanisha, for um, just joining us. I'm, I'm sure it's been quite early here in the UK. So thanks again for joining us. So I think now just going back before before we go to, to the next session, I do have a few quick Q&As, if, if that's all right, with um, with um, Dr. Ek and Kanisha for, for some Q&A. So, so just to go back, um, Dr. Ek, um, you, you were mentioning about the next steps, how how you know uh, this is going to be implemented and will be further refined in in into uh, you know the next phase of the projects essentially. Could you please elaborate a little bit more on like what's the specific and how to, um, in your work with the TSRI? What's the next step? And if I am interested to to take part, what's in it for me? What's next for me? How can I be a part of it? So um, for um, Foodinopolis, for Foodinopolis, so um, have been working with. Uh, Risk councils and um, our uh, UK consultant from Cranfield. So we will continue um, using the the results, the information from uh, foresight workshop. As Kanisha mentioned, foresight is a um, strategic tool, a uh, strategic planning tool uh, for um, for the roadmap for the uh, policies forward. So we will, Foodinopolis 
we'll, we'll work on that uh, with also um, the help from a consultant. And also, um, as I mentioned earlier, that we, we start to involve policy makers, for example, uh, TSRI and NEXPO in this project. And they are very much interested in um, participating in the future project together with uh, Fortinopolis, uh, uh, with the help of Risk Council and our consultant in other sectors apart from food. Because um, if you notice the, the title of, of our project is Foresight into the BCG economy. And uh, we all know that BCG economy is not only food, there's other sectors as well, including health and uh, medicines, tourism, energies. Uh, so we would extend it further to other sectors uh, with TSRI and with uh, our consultants and risk council in uh, other BCT sectors for uh, using foresight as the strategic planning tools for those sectors. And also um, during our uh, workshop, we discussed about other things as well, other tools, which is resilience. So I think uh, maybe we'll, that that's might be um, our uh, future collaboration on this topic as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eganong. Um, it's great to hear there's something to look forward to in, into the future of, of this project. Very much looking forward to, to be a part as well. Um, can, you <laughs> <Of share? course. laughs> can, can you share a question for you? If you could just, so we, you were involved in, in you know, the, the development of, of this whole process here in Thailand. What's your experience in, in, in the UK or even like in your past experience? What were the challenges? So, so that we are then be fully prepared for the upcoming future for Thailand. Could you please share with us the, sh the challenges that might be possible? Um, a, a good question, Bank. Um, I, I think possibly uh, my last comment in, in the presentation reflects probably the, the, the most significant challenge um, for us. Um, a lot of the, the foresight work we do is with government organizations. Um, and I think there's, there's often been a cultural uh, challenge in terms of embedding foresight tools in a policy context. Policy is very, very much evidence-based. It's very much about what are the problems? Uh, what's the evidence that this is a problem um, and that I need to kind of fund the solution to it? Um, so what, are, what, what does that problem present in terms of risks, challenges that need urgent attention? Um, and then only then are, are policymakers, government organizations, um keen to uh really expand resources to to address the problem so it's quite reactive um we are what we're suggesting here with foresight is a more proactive approach uh dealing with problems before they become a problem before we know <laughs> the problem exists and that is a huge challenge really um convincing individuals that they need contingency plans um, resources to back those contingency plans, um, resources that are earmarked and, and, and secured to back contingency plans, that, that requires quite, you know, quite a lot of substantial evidence. So when we present the outputs of, foresight, of a foresight exercise, the policymakers, um, one of the questions we, we're often asked is, well, what, where is the evidence? Um, how, do I, how do you convince me that we need to act? So this is where this is why I say we now need to start to embed foresight with other decision support tools so that we we, de we develop a more convincing business case for action. Um, and that's to me a, a, a still a, a work in progress and, and reflective of um, uh, the, the most significant challenge working with any government organization or policy um, policy body uh, across across nations really. Okay, thank you very much, Kinesha. And I think from, from, from looking at the time, that's unfortunately the time we have for the Q&A for Dr. Ekanong and, and Kinesha. So thanks again for your presentation. Yeah, it's been a very great journey. I myself was a part of it. So it's been, it's been great to getting to work around this area. And I pretty much look forward to, to the future on it. So thank you much, both, both of you. So I think before we go into um, the, the final session today, 
I just want to quickly recap that today we've been talking a lot about the food system, the food and agriculture. So we're starting off with them, you know, looking at the resilience of the food system by, by Dr. Pong, Pong Tip, right? We're mentioning how food itself is not just about food. We then talk about, you know, how we can increase value from, from different kinds of waste from, from the agriculture sector, from, you know, and from, from seafood waste. So definitely that is going to be a lot of developments going forward and, in, and including that on the development, technical development side of things where you know there are now new services, new types of uh, data usage that can help to promote development of the food sector as well. And going back in full circle, you also hear on how the Thailand food sector is trying to be fully prepared using the tools of foresight to make sure we do have a plan we, so that we are ready. But then what next? The question is, what, what next? So I'm just going to uh, send over uh, the, the final session to our country director of British Council Thailand uh, to talk a little bit more about what the British Council is going to be offering you and how we can support you into the future uh, for mutual benefit between Thailand and the UK. So Helga, if you're ready, I'll send over to you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, Sarika. Um, and greetings to the NSTDA um, annual conference team, to the speakers uh, from today and to all of the participants who've joined us online. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, just for a few slides um, to, to close the session. Can you see my slides? Just a second, Helga, it's loading. Okay. I, mean, I, I can um, I can start um, by just introducing um, the main mission of the British Council. Um, you may be aware that the British Council is the UK's international um, cultural relations organisation um, uh, for um, uh, education opportunities, and we work across um, 100 countries. And we were founded back in 1934, so heading to 90 years uh, in existence. And, and this is our main mission that we aim to build connections, understanding and trust between the UK and the countries where we work overseas, um, in this case, um, in Thailand. Um, and we work through three main pillars and uh, we work in all of those pillars um, in Thailand. We don't in all countries. Um, and just to say that as of tomorrow, we will be celebrating our 70th anniversary uh, in Thailand, uh, we started here um, as as the British Council entity in 1952. Um, so the three pillars are, as you can see, um, English, um, arts and culture, and education. And obviously, the the work we've been talking about today falls very neatly under our um, education um, uh, SBU, as we call it. Um, we aim to um, basically do. Um, in all of our work, we aim to that, that we have mutual benefit. Um, that the, the slide is not moving. That the um, the work should be as systemic as possible, um, and that it is sustainable. Um, so, just showing here that when when we look at our country plan, we have a look at you know what is the what are the priorities for the government in Thailand um, and ministerial partners, and we try to match that with what expertise um, and experience and insight we can bring to those uh, from the UK. Um, with our work in um, specifically in education, we have a wide range um, of uh, areas that we work in, um, and, and you've heard about uh, a lot of those today. Um, essentially, we um, our newest area of work is, is the, the one you're seeing on the screen, the Going Global Partnerships, and the one most relevant um, to this discussion, um, where we have an overarching program, um, which um, has its ultimate aim, as it says there, to build stronger, more inclusive and internationally connected higher education systems, as well as creating globally connected human capital. And we believe that is, is really important because we need to um, essentially um, resolve big global challenges encompassed uh, by things like the, the Sustainable Development Goals. And it is not possible for any one country to be able to do that, So, which is why we want um, to enable um, systems uh, to be able to talk to each other and, and to be the, the highest quality they can. Um, so we have four strands um, under the, this Going Global Partnerships Programme. And as you can see from this, um, we have three 
three of those are active in Thailand and, and have been um, recently. So you've already uh, heard a lot from uh, Kanisha and Dr. Akinong on the fantastic foresight into the BCG economy project, which um, is uh, under our strengthening higher education and TVET systems um, strand, as I mentioned earlier, and, and we see great um, opportunities for those roadmaps that have been produced to have a really systemic uh, impact um, uh, across Thailand. Um, you uh, have also been talking about um, uh, the Newton um, Fund projects earlier, and that would be under our enabling research um, strand. Um, but we also have some other projects such as Researcher Connect, um, which enables uh, capacity building of researchers in key skills, um, as well as the Research Environment Links project, where we've been um, providing grants um, to to um, to seed fund and, and enable um, pieces of research and joint research to take place. And then the final one that I haven't touched on uh, is the internationalization strand. And and here we've been we're working very closely with the Ministry of Higher Education, uh, Science, Research and Innovation on their reinventing universities um, initiative um, under um, a program we call the Thai UK World Class University Consortium where we have um, 21 Thai and UK universities collaborating together on 15 projects, um, which are quite wide ranging, but the aim is to, um, is to improve the quality and, and, and the internationalization. Um, so things ranging from transnational education, curriculum uh, development, um, uh, design, student and faculty mobility, as well as research pieces. So, these projects are ongoing, um, but we're moving uh, as of tomorrow into a new uh, financial year for us and, and we hope to be developing and, and building on these strands going forwards. Um, it wouldn't be fair not to mention uh, the Newton Fund um, before I finish, as this is a program that we have delivered um, over the past seven years in Thailand and the grant recipients you heard earlier today are just some of the fantastic projects. Um, that have come under, under that program. Um, as you may know, uh, the Newton Fund is ending, but our connections with the researchers uh, who have taken part to date remain very strong, and we do hope um, to work with that cohort and others in the future for any related opportunities. Uh, just a final couple of things um, to mention. Um, we have cross-cutting themes also across our work, and one of them um, um, has been climate, and climate change, uh, and as you know, you're probably aware, the UK was hosting the COP26 uh, UN Climate Change Conference last year, and we have supported workshops for researchers um, to meet and learn from one another with the opportunity to gain seed funding in that area, and that's something that we think will continue as a thematic for us. And last uh, but not least, um, equality, diversity and inclusion is also a very strong cross-cutting theme for us, um, touching on critical social issues. And uh, again, we have uh, some areas, um, particularly under gender equality, we're offering uh, a number of um, women in STEM scholarships. So, so fully funded scholarships to study master's courses in STEM areas in the UK uh, for women, um, as well as uh, working on a project with Simeo Ryhead at the moment on strengthening um, leadership in uh, gender equality and diversity. Um, at the executive level of universities um, across Southeast Asia, and that includes Thailand. So these are just some parts of our work at the British Council um, that, that kind of embody what we do, which is essentially bringing people together, sharing expertise and knowledge. Um, and if you are interested in collaborating further with us, please do get in touch um, and, and we'd love to, to look at new opportunities going forwards. I will finish uh, today by just giving a huge thanks to our partner, the NSTDA, um, for supporting us in this event, but also as for being a fantastic partner in many uh, of our projects um, to date. Also, thanks to the British Embassy team and to the Newton Fund for the opportunities to deliver the Newton Fund date, uh, work to date and, and for supporting the great projects that have come out of it. I look forward to deepening and developing further collaboration going forwards. Thank you, Kapinka. Thank you very much, Helga, for this. So, um, so I think we've been quite very clear about what we're going to offer to you. So if you're interested, do contact us at the British Council. My myself, I'm also at the British Council, so you know who to call. 
So thank you very much once again, Helga, for this. And of course, all the seven speakers that have attended today. I just realized it's a very, um, you know, um, a very insightful, not only being insightful, but also it's all women. So women leadership all the way. And I do completely agree with you, Helga, on this. Um, so yes, we've indeed come, have quite come quite a long way in terms of uh, the, the food and agriculture sector, in terms of the research and development, as well as the preparation going into the future. And there are many opportunities ahead that I'm sure will, will, will come over the next year or two. But that's, I think that's all the time we do have left for today. I'm, I do apologize for slightly going overboard. So it's now three minutes late, so I'll be very quick on, on, the, on the final closing remarks. So thanks again, all speakers, as well as all the participants um, joining on all of the platform, whether it's WebEx or on the Facebook Live. So thanks again. Now, before you go, um, before you go and, and leave the platform, um, our team has set up a notification that will turn up on your right-hand side of the screen. And this will lead you to the feedback form. So again, we would be very grateful for your honest feedback on how you feel about the sessions, what, what's the takeaways, do you have any feedbacks from, from me, for the team, or anything, just do, do send us your feedbacks. Um, also to let you know that at the end of today, today evening, our team will also be sending you the slight set of slides that were presented by the speakers today. So do watch out on that on, on your email inbox too. Once again, we'd like to thank our partners um, for making this project a reality, the NSTDA for allowing us to take part in this wonderful conference, the British Embassy, Bangkok, FCDO, and BASE for their support under the new 10 fund and beyond over the past years and making sure the projects became a reality. To all the speakers as well, and partnering organizations from Thai UK universities, from Foodinopolis, and from Cranfield University. Thank you very much. And my name is Shwidu Tamashai from British Council. It's a very great pleasure to be hosting this session for you all. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. Take care.